The following pre-recorded program is sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts. Welcome to About Money, a different approach to investing you won't hear anywhere else. Your hosts, the AFC team, Mike, Chris, and Al, are registered investment advisors who have a proven track record of managing long-term investments surpassing the markets. The information shared on the following program is for educational purposes only, and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. And now, here's your AFC team, Mike, Chris, and Al. And it's Saturday, and we're going to be talking about money. You know, it seems... Like it's been a long year in many ways, from November 4th to October 12th, thinking that that may be the, have been the bottom of the market. You know, people describe 1972 the same way. It just trundled down, down, down. It's felt that way. But for some people, it happened very quickly. Like you're worth $18 billion on a Monday, <laughs> and on Friday, you're broke. That's the story of Sam Bankman Fried, 30 year old, and yet he palled around with people like Steph Curry from the Golden State Warriors, quarterback Tom Brady, tons of polit politicians. He was on the cover of Forbes, he was on the cover of magazines, he was on TV. He was widely celebrated. At one time, worth over $20 billion. $26 billion to be exact. 26, as Al said. Wow. And broke, and broke. Not two nickels to rub together. <laughs> it rubs, reminds me of Madoff and Enron and Exodus Communications and Elizabeth Holmes from Theranos. World, don't forget WorldCom. And, and WorldCom. And, Ty and Tyco. And Tyco and so many others anyway. So what happened? So we want to take the program today to talk about Sam Bankman Fried and the story of FTX and Alameda Research. What happened? When? Why don't we start with some of his background? Man, there's a lot to unpack. And I'm, I'm probably just as surprised as most people. You know, Sam was considered in the industry, uh, you know, a very trustworthy guy. He pushed for regulation. He's, he was well connected. He was a guy that a lot of people liked. But for some background, he was born in 92 from Cal in California from a pretty academic and politically connected family. His mom, Barbara Fried, was a lawyer and she actually co-founded a couple of democratic organizations such as Mind the Gap. His father, on the other hand, was a law professor and he would, you know, help Sam make, you know, raise some money for his company, FTX. But he only graduated in 2014 from MIT. And at that time, he had no clue what he was going to do, right? He, after graduating, he decided he'd go and, and work at Jane Street Capital. And this is really where his ambitions took off. At Jane Street, he would not only meet, you know, a number of people that would help him start Almeida and FTX, but he would uh, meet a very interesting gal by the name of Caroline Ellison. And as, as the program goes on today, we're going to have a lot. We're going to come back to her because she's a very important figure. But essentially, in 2017 and at Jane Street, he learned the crypto industry. He found this weird loophole where he could buy Bitcoin in America for a lower price. And then later in the, in the evening, he could sell it to Japan for, you know, way more, right? And so he ended up, the more he got comfortable, he, he started trading upwards of $25 million a day. So it was no, no small feat. That's a chunk of change. Yeah. This guy, I mean, what is he, three years removed from college and he's trading $25 million a day? I mean, that's, I don't know. You, would, you wouldn't give me those kind of reins three no. years after college. <laughs> Take the million off and maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're going we're gonna to come back to come back to Sam a little bit, but it's really important to understand who Caroline was, right? When she graduated, she had no clue what she was going to do. She's a little... Was she, she at MIT too? Was she? Yeah, she was at oh, MIT. Oh, she at MIT too. Okay. Yeah, at MIT. And so that's where the chemistry really started. And she was really, she's smart, right? She's really smart, but her background is math and it's, it has nothing to do with trading and you know and crypto nonetheless a couple of years earlier she didn't even know what this was she was looking for a path but to give you an idea of what she was like we have to dive into her social media we have to understand what she posts and you know really what she thinks and to give you guys a better idea on april 5th of last year she tweeted nothing like regular amphetamine to use nothing excuse me nothing like regular amphetamine use to make you appreciate how dumb a lot of normal non-medicated human experience is 
This is the, the gal that's managing over $10 billion at Almeida. And CEO of the company. And CEO of the yeah. company. Exactly. And then to go further, I ended up looking at her, her Tumblr. And on there, it, I'm not going to go... This is, a, this is supposed to be for kids, so I'm not going to go too deep into it, but she was very fond of the polyamory lifestyle. She was with about 10 individuals in a house in the Bahamas, and she believed that there needed to be a hierarchy to the polyamory and that there, everyone needs to know their ranks, and it's a vicious power struggles for the higher ranks. So this gives you a little idea of what, you know, what she's like. For those who don't know what polyamory is, <laughs> I'll let you describe <laughs> it's not exclusive sexual relations, so you have several different partners, all at the same time, sometimes single, sometimes double, whatever it is. But it, anyway, mm -hmm. it's kind of like an orgy, but on a regular basis. <laughs> a committed orgy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so... So why, why am I bringing up Caroline? Well, th there's, there's a couple of reasons. We're going to come to one later when we get into the Gary Gensler. But, but she was, her and Sam had a, a very tight-knit relationship. She, <laughs> she's, I don't even know how to describe this, Mike. <laughs> I, I, um, she's just an interesting character. She really is. <laughs> I, Spit it out, Chris. I, I'm having a hard time doing it. She's just a very interesting character, and I'm going to leave it at that. So I want to I go into actually what FTX is now and really migrate back that way. So FTX is, is a cryptocurrency derivative exchange. Said simply, it is for the professional crypto players, right? It's a very nice website if you've ever been on. It's a way for people to really leverage their money in, in these different markets. And, and, and most exchanges don't offer this. What type of leverage were they offering? Do you know? It was a lot of a lot of different derivatives. Okay. But highly we'd have to go into highly leveraged. Highly leveraged. Yeah. yeah. We'd yeah. have to go into staking. We'd have to go into a couple of different things. But really she so FTX, trying to figure out where to go with all of this because there's so much to unpack. It's an exchange. It's an exchange. Yeah, but like when you trade on the Forex exchange, you're only allowed 50, 50 to 1 leverage. You know, if you trade on a Forex exchange in another exchange that's in like the Seychelles Islands or the Bahamas, they'll allow you to like, fi that's why he set up in the Bahamas, because even though it's unregulated, as I said, Forex in the United States, because of years ago, because of, you know, a lot of corruption and people losing a ton of money, it's only 50 to 1. But if you go to these other, the Bahamas and these other islands, it's 500, 1,000 to 1 leverage you can get. Yeah. So by putting up $1,000, you can actually trade 100. 10 million. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't take much if the market moves against you to wipe you out. Yep. Or if it moves with you, you make a lot of money. But it's an exchange. And most exchanges are regulated. FTX? Unregulated. 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 And that's the, that might be why they set up in, set up in the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, it's really important to note that FTX International is really the one at, at the wrong here. The U.S. branch is said to be okay. So that's, that's interesting to note right there. But who really knows? So going back, so Almeida. So there's, so there's this relationship between FTX, the exchange, and Alameda. And Alameda is essentially like a crypto hedge fund. They would carry out trades, they would match buyers and sellers, and they would give investors a return. So why would anyone trust them? Well, in their, essentially their prospectus, they offered a 15% annualized rate of return, which was essentially their only investment product. They promoted that the high returns with, they had no risk, they had no downside, and that they were 100% guaranteed full payment of the principal and interest enforceable under the law of the United States. And so, you know, to your average investor, a 15% guaranteed return, I mean, that's phenomenal. That's what Bernie was to saying. That's to, what Bernie was. 10 to 16, Bernie said 10 to 16%. And Bernie only had one quarter where we lost money, which as a trader is unheard of. And, mm -hmm. he, lost, and he lost 1% in that quarter. And so, and the CEO, Caroline, she would talk about, you know, you know, I never thought I would do this for a career. She basically said that this was easy and she didn't have to use her math degree. She said that she uses very little math. It's usually like elementary at best. And she can't remember a time that she had lost a ton of money. Boy, did that take age poorly. Cause this was just a couple of months ago that she said all these things, right? So that gives us a little bit of, bit of background on what they were doing. So the problem, so why do we bring all of this up? Well, essentially, FTX created a coin FTT. 
It is a crypto coin. Exactly. They called it a stable coin. Right? No, 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 this no, one wasn't no, considered a stable. I wasn't coin. considered. Okay. Yeah, this was just a, a a coin that they minted out of thin air, and essentially, this is how they would transfer money back and forth between different firms, right? And so, if you you, you originally got to put your dollars in, right, and then they would flip it over to FTT tokens. Okay. And they can move FTT not just to Alameda, but to any number of other companies as well that they would purchase and buy. Yeah. So. And then and then when then things started going down, he was what was he doing when things started when Get crypto started taking going down, he was saying, Oh, I'll be the savior, right? I'm gonna oh. come in and buy everybody out at the low prices. Yeah. Oh yeah, he said that. And and it, it really it backfired because for a long time this FTT token, it wasn't traded much. It was pretty like it wasn't very volatile. There wasn't a lot of a lot of action on it, right? And so essentially what this company would do to make money is they would create a coin they would artificially put like a value to it, right? And then they would use this as collateral to finance different projects. Um, we'll, we'll get back to more of this when we come back from the break. FTT is critical to understand with this whole thing, but you're already getting a picture of what went on and why somebody went from $18 billion on Monday to completely broke on Friday. But it relates to so many others like Enron and Exodus, Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos. About money with your AFC team, Mike, Chris, and Al on AM 1300, The Answer. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. So let's come back and talk about FTT. FTT, the coin. So this coin was a way for the company to move around money. That's, that's the simple way of putting it, right? When you put a US dollar into an exchange, right? You then need to, you need to exchange that for different tokens, right? That's how that ends up working. And so what FT, FTX was doing is they were taking customer deposit, they were putting it into FTT, and then they were loaning out, essentially they were trading the FTT, right, in wash sales. So they were trading it themselves because it wasn't, you know, there was very low volume. That would artificially raise the price. So they would make a bunch of trades, say raise it three bucks, right? Raise a million dollars. <laughs> And then after the price was, you know, inflated, they would then go to the bank in which Sam owned, right? He owns this actual bank and he would use that FTT token as collateral. It's similar to what the bucket shops do sometimes with stocks is they are the ones that are really controlling the trade. And so they pump, it's called pump and dump. Mm -hmm. So you press the, the price of the stock way up and then you dump it at the higher price. Except FTT didn't do the dump side of it. Mm -mm. They just pumped it and borrowed money against it. That is the crazy part. And what's interesting is if you were to take customer deposits and then invest that, that would be hugely illegal. But because they were flipping it into their own token, because this isn't regulated, there, it's a very gray line with what he was doing. And so he's under how, he's not under arrest, but he's under police monitoring right now, which is important <laughs> to note because they can't arrest him because of what, you know, because it's not a secure. So very, it's very, it's very interesting. But, but I want to go back to really the relationship um, between Sam, Caroline, and then Caroline's dad. So Sam, we've already, we've already established that Sam and Caroline have a relationship, right? But what's interesting to note is Caroline's dad was actually the professor of economics at MIT. Well, who was one of his uh, employees while at MIT? Gary Gensler, the current SEC chairman. And so there's this weird inner circle that, that's going on. And then if you continue to look, you'll note that Sam was actually a huge donor for not only the regulation, but he would donate to a lot of political parties, upwards of $50 million. We had another partner at the firm that would also donate money to you know the Republicans. So there's, they were getting it on both sides, right? I believe that was half the amount, 25 million. But they had a lot of influence. And so this is where things get very weird. It was. It looks like it was sometime in 2021, Sam went behind closed doors and he was lobbying for a brokerage-like licensing system. And he proposed that there would be, like we have a license, that there would be a similar license for the cryptocurrency and, and industry. Well, at this seminar, I'm gonna call it, Sam was pleading to Gary, essentially, you know, he, they wanted to talk about the custody of digital secu asset securities and propose like propose this license. Well, this license would directly hurt 
one of their competitors, Binance, which is another one of the big exchanges in the industry. So this really put Binance's CEO, CZ, in, in a tough spot, and it really pissed him off. And this would end up coming back to, to, uh, to hurt them quite a bit. And so CZ had actually been an owner of FTX, and he had about two, what was it, $100 million at first? And he had about $100 million, and then he ended up getting bought out. But when he got bought out, he got about $2 billion, but that was all in FTT tokens. And so what he ended up doing was tweeting out that. So first, before this happened, there was an article that got released that FTX has bad books, right? And this was a leak. We don't know where that leak came from. Right after that happened, CZ then tweets that as part of this investigation, he is going to sell out all of his FTT tokens. Well, once that happened in a token that's not highly traded or there's not a lot of volume, that's going to cause a huge impact to it. And right, and all of FTX's money is tied up in this token. And so when he crashed the token, essentially the empire, the house of cards came, came falling down. Not unlike Enron, I'm like... Not unlike Enron. That's the thing that's, in, that's so interesting about this in, in, in comparison to Enron is they had Almeida and they had this FTX. And like Enron, Enron was hiding its losses in these special purpose vehicles, which are legitimate accounting techniques that people use. Mm -hmm. But they hid all the losses so Wall Street, advisor, or Wall Street could not see that, what was going on. Now, with, they, with, with Enron, when they published their financial numbers, they did not publish a balance sheet. Oh. So all the things that were off balance sheet yeah. were completely hidden. Mm -hmm. And so they got involved in trading as well, but trading in the electrical market because utilities have long-term contracts where they're buying power at a given rate for a long period of time. I started my career at Intalco and they had a contract with Bonneville Power that they would buy power at two tenths of a cent per kilowatt hour. And it was a 10 or 15 or 20 year contract because when you're making aluminum, you're consuming a lot of power, two cents per kilowatt hour. I was off by 10. So you have long-term contracts, but you also have short-term contracts. And it's the short-term contracts, like when you have a brownout somewhere, you buy power from somewhere else. When you have a very difficult winter, you're buying power from somewhere else. Everyone in the US is trading power across the nation. The grid, that's the grid. The only place that didn't have the grid was Texas. And remember last year when everything froze up because Texas couldn't buy power from somewhere else. Well, at that time, too, they, there was a big deregulation of power, yeah. deregulation of natural oh, yeah. gas that allowed Kenley and, and, and Enron to start trading these, you know, and, and then they were holding, there was some stories in them holding California over the barrel and they wanted to buy power and they had brownouts. Oh, yeah. And, and they were charging huge prices. Yeah. And didn't they have a lot of capacity is what I read? They had twice the capacity of available energy for, mm -hmm. the, for California, yet they were having brownouts? Well... Yeah, California had, but because they were in the middle of winter and having a tough time, or the middle of summer and having a tough time, they always bought power from somewhere else. And it was always this short-term immediate payment, but Enron was trading in this. And when prices were going up, they were making a lot of money. And when prices started to go down, and they created derivatives just like they do, like FTX. Right? They had, there wasn't just, they were selling on future prices and future and futures in it, and they were booking the profits even though they weren't collecting the money yet. And they were doing things for the people within Enron and creating limited partnerships, yep. which included the founders and the main managers of Enron were collecting millions of dollars through these limited partnerships. And so the all of that was going on and normally a company would be disclosing all of that on their books mm -hmm. but there was no balance sheet they refused to show people the balance sheet because when the f they first began to do that people were questioning why are you making this partnership so if you don't want the questions you just don't <laughs> yeah and then and then arthur anderson is actually they were the guys were shredding documents yeah it was shredding. Wasn't that during the trial or something like that? Well, before, but when they figured it out, they started shredding documents to hide their accounting. They weren't doing their auditing job. I don't know if it was the whole company, but there were people there that were probably being paid off that 
decided and I just read documents because they got acquitted about three years after that the Supreme Court said no Arthur Anderson really wasn't at fault with this it got completely thrown out but the company by then was only 200 people and it was 85,000 at the height of its height yeah so that it really caused the fall of Arthur Anderson they were one of the big eight yep. accounting wow. firms they died over the Enron thing. Mm -hmm. I heard Enron was even, at one point, they were trading the weather. Was yeah. that correct? Yes, that's correct. <laughs> How do you... <laughs> well, because that determines power usage. When it's really cold, uh -huh. uh -huh. you need more power. That makes sense. And this, the CFO, Andrew Fastow, was, I mean, they were arrogant people. I mean, when underlings would ask him questions, he would just say, well, you're not smart enough to understand what we're doing. That was his answer. <laughs> Well, they, a, they, they thought they were smarter than everyone else and that they'd never get caught, right? They just make shell companies every time there was a loss. And yeah. So you see a lot of the same threads running through. I mean, you talk about Sam and what's her name? Uh, Caroline. Caroline? Caroline Ellison. Out of MIT? Out of MIT. You can talk about Elizabeth Holmes out of Stanford. <laughs> you can. Another really brilliant young person, 19 years old, comes up with this idea for... One prick, one drop of blood, you can do 200 different tests and markets that as Theranos, marketed to some very significant personalities. The board of directors included George Schultz, included yeah. Miller, who was secretary of, of something I don't remember. Who, um, who was the general there that? Milley. No, the other one that was with Trump. What was his name? I can't think of his name. Milley. Mattis. 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 Yeah, yeah, Matt, yeah. Matt, Matt, Matt Dog, Dog Mattis. Mattis. Yep, him. Mad Schultz. Dog Mattis. Let me yeah. tell you, he's a, when I was at Wazoo, he came and gave us a pump-up speech to the football team. And I have never wanted to run through a brick wall for anyone in my life until I, I heard this man speak. I mean, he's from Pullman, too, fun fact. Yeah. But he's the real deal. I, he is the real deal. But then they had David, uh, famous... And probably the most powerful That's, lawyer in the country, David Bowes, working Bose, for them. Bowes, the, the attorney. Yeah. They had Kissinger. Henry Kissinger Henry, was on the yeah. board. Uh -huh. The only William thing Perry. that them, like, they, were, they weren't public yet. No. They were private, so they could hot, they didn't have to uh, produce accounting and balance sheets and all that stuff. So no one really knew, except for the insiders, knew what was going on. That was a, sh uh, a, a, fr a total fraud. But even with balance sheets, I don't think it would have shown up that their technology didn't work. Yeah. And yet, think of the companies that bought into it, Walgreens and Safeway. You mm -hmm. go into Safeway and you have this little place where you get your flu shot or whatever. Mm -hmm. That was all done because they invested in Theranos with the expectation they were going to become something incredible. Because with one drop of blood, you get 200 tests. We live in a very fascinating time. About money continues. Remember the website adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here's your AFC team, Mike, Chris, and Al. So going back to FTX, there's a lot of people that got involved in this and, and off the air we were just joking that uh, the real reason Tom Brady got got is getting a divorce is because it looks like he lost his entire fortune. <laughs> he invested it all in. $650 million into FTX. He's yeah. going to be playing until he's 80 now. <laughs> Not because he wants to. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to be the only octogenarian on there. No. You know, it's kind of funny because he's, he, his contract ends with, with Tampa Bay this year. So he's going to be a free agent. Oh. What if they try to pay him in Bitcoin once again? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's not the only one affected. Stephen Curry, he was affected. Larry David was one of them that had invested. And he, he, he had a funny commercial. No, he, that, that, that's a hilarious commercial. But here's, a, here's the thing. Should they be responsible, right? Because they held one of the Kardashians responsible for mm -hmm. pumping one of the crypto things. And she said, no, you can't do that. And so... Should they have a responsibility in knowing that they're pumping something and having people investing in it and it's going to lose? I think it goes to intent. You know, because when you, when you really look into this story, not a lot of people knew what was actually going on. There was no board of directors, right? FTX doesn't have any board of directors. There's really two people that have access to, you know, most of what's going on, most of the, the, the capital and the algorithms. And so people didn't know. And so for these, you know... When FTX sponsors like the Miami Heat, you have patches on Major League Baseball, they have celebrities. I mean, yeah, that, that's like uh, Enron. Remember Enron? Because who was president at the time? George W. Bush. Where was he from? Houston. Houston. Uh -huh. Where, who owned this? It was Enron Field at the time. <laughs> Here's Ken Lay and 
George W. holding their hands up in this box, <laughs> right? 2001, right before the implosion. That didn't. It goes, it goes to a point, you know, when you look at TV and you hear the celebrities touting a product or touting FTX, they're not experts. Mm -hmm. But they're, Mike, it wasn't just them. There, there's banks too. I mean, there, there's very smart people that invested in this company. Kevin O'Leary, one of the Shark Tank guys, he invested. BlackRock. Soft, BlackRock, SoftBank. I mean, he fooled a lot of people, uh, you know. It, <sighs> I think once you get one, it's like Thanos, right? Once you get one of those people in, it's easy to fool all their friends, mm -hmm. yes. people they know. They're gullible. Once you get that first big whale, the rest of them will come swimming in. I know. And it was the same with Madoff. You think you had very, very sophisticated people that were investing, hedge funds and money managers that were investing with Madoff. And you almost had the feeling that they knew there was something wrong because they're in the business. They're very smart. They're very capable people. They almost had to know there was something wrong. And what took one guy in Boston? What was, I can't think of his name. Hedge fund in Boston, those guys running money. The guys that owned the Mets. Mm. They were $450 million in Tomatoff. Yeah. You have to wonder if they... They didn't know there was something wrong, but they thought it was front running or something. See, but it's they different. didn't realize it was a Ponzi scheme and it was their money going out. Yeah, but if, I mean, statistically, if you were seeing that type of return every year without one loss, without one down mm -hmm. quarter, one down quarter in out of all those years, what was just 1%, you got to ask yourself what's going on. And nobody's, even Warren Buffett. The great investors all had at least a bad year, bad quarter. He had none, zero. And quite honestly, if interest rates hadn't gone up, this would still be going on. Because most of the trades that they got in were because, you know, loaning got more expensive. And then they had a lot of trades that soured. But remember the big thing that happened with Alameda Research. We're back to FTX, right? Mm -hmm. Alameda Research, they were trading and doing a lot of trades. Mm -hmm. And they had to transfer $10 billion dollars to cover the trading losses at Alameda, which was illegal, for which they'll probably go to prison for a long time because they took customer accounts and money out of customer accounts to fund Alameda. I mean, you think of, anytime I hear this, I think of things that have gone on before, like Rhonda Briard in the Seattle area, used to do commercials on radio, Help me, Rhonda, by the Beach Boys. <laughs> so she was a Merrill broker who went out on her own. And she set up a company, an extra company. And the stories are funny. But anyway, I'm sure that she didn't start that way. But when she was losing money, she started borrowing money from client accounts. And eventually, she was taking client money or starting with new clients and putting them not into her RIA, but putting them into another company, a healthcare company. Mm -hmm. And of course, as the regulators came down, they found voodoo dolls in her freezer with pins stuck. <laughs> 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 with names of the regulators on the voodoo dolls. <laughs> <laughs> Help me, Rhonda. <laughs> That's too, that's too much. These stories, they're just one after another. But moving $10 billion of client money from FTX to Alameda mm -hmm. is very definitely illegal. Mm -hmm. That's a conflict of interest. It's why regulators, whenever they look at companies, they always look at conflicts of interest and outside business activities to make sure that people aren't moving money to the outside business activity. And that's why I don't get why he could loan out money, how he was a bank, he was the exchange, and he was the yeah, hedge fund. Since he's, not re since he's not regulated, where does this leave him? Since it's unregulated, where does it leave him? It left him open to do whatever he wanted to do. Right. So how do you how do you process? What are you going to prosecute him on? What kind of you can't come down and say yeah. SEC rule da nine dash six dash three dash four. You can't. What are you going to prosecute him on? They prosecute him on the ten billion dollars that went from FTX to Alameda. 
I mean, but, but they get, beyond that, who knows? But isn't that kind of what banks do, right? They they take our take the money, they put it into different you know treasuries, you know money market, right? And then they loan out that money, and they have to have about ten percent on hand, right? Well, they did the same thing, except they had loaned out nine billion, and they only had nine hundred million on well, on that, hand, right? So that's that's about but, ten. But that's what the banks did back in two in, in before two thousand eight, right? They mm-hmm. were they were over leveraged. Mm-hmm. The bank, the you know, uh, even uh, Alan Greenspan, I didn't think the banks would uh, eat, basically eat their young. I didn't think they would do that, but they did. Yeah. They gutted their own systems and took way too much risk. And so how are you going to prosecute this guy? You have no regulations to prosecute him on. And you're saying, and he could use those statutes and say, well, okay, I pay the ultimate price like Lehman Brothers. Mm-hmm. But no, I don't think anybody went to jail with Lehman Brothers, did they? No. Yeah, exactly. So I think this kid's going to walk away. away with the three hundred million dollars. I think this kid's going to walk away. Might not walk away with any money, but I don't see how they're going to prosecute him. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because Kevin O'Leary, he's he's very involved. He's an investor. He's a paid spokesperson. He's he's very involved. He actually inquired about owning it because essentially what this was was a run on the bank. There was some sketchy stuff going on, right? But what yeah. really happened, it was a run on the bank. Yeah. And so his question was, well. If we can stop this run, and if it's a liquidity problem, kind of like what Robinhood had a number of, uh, what was that, last year? If we can stop that, how much do you need? And can I become CEO? But the problem is now it's become such a hot item because it's going to get regulated, because all politicians are talking about it. It's beyond their control at this point. And it's bad because it's a, it was a quality exchange. Like the actual software was, you know, it was nice. Yeah. You have to wonder if it would have been just the exchange if it wouldn't have survived. If they hadn't had the losses on Alameda, if they hadn't had to deal with inflation and rising interest rates, if it would not have, it, if it would not have been around today, I think it would. I, you know, if they just hadn't made those bad losses, I, I absolutely think because they have between them and Binance, they have about I think it's like eighty two percent of the market, and they're a huge player. I mean, they're they're part of the uh, World Economic Forum. They're a sponsor. I mean, these are not. <laughs> this is not a small player. No, like the, we talked about Credit Suisse a while back and the stupid bets they made. What, mm-hmm. four, four, or eight billion? I can't remember how many billions it was. So these guys were just overconfident, made stupid bets. What are they really going to charge him on? I, I don't know. That's why he's only being, what is it? They're, they're watching him. They can't do anything. The police are just watching him. Plus, right with now. his political connections that he has, he's got a lot. He's got friends on both sides of the aisle. We'll see what that return on $50 million to the political but <laughs> donations gets him. Let's, let's get back. What does this do to the confidence in the markets, right? We're, in a, we're, we're potentially a lot of people predicting going into a recession, mild recession or whatever. We're having inflation problems. Now we have a crisis of a company like this. A guy worth $26 billion is broke in a week. What does this do to the average investor looking to, to invest? He's saying, hey, what's, what's going on? Well, it makes, it makes the point of dealing with transparent companies where you can see where things are and know what you're invested in and see that there's actually a tracking so you know what what the investments are. Where the exchange is not the company you're dealing with, but the exchange is independent. And where the pricing power or pricing is independent of where you have your funds. I think all those are important things. Oh, I agree with you. I mean, it, this company creating its own coin, basically printing its own money, mm-hmm. in essence. You know, no, when they no, needed more money, they would just make a few trades, prop it push up. Push the price up. Yeah. And yeah. then and then go to the bank and, and take, you know, use, use that as collateral. Yeah, I mean, it's no different than uh, it is. And, I mean, like Bernie was the same thing Bernie was kind of doing, was they basically print his own money. With taking it from one person, giving it to the other person, and he was he had, but he had a legitimate business too. He had a legitimate business, mm-hmm. which is interesting. Oh, he started, and he was doing pretty well in that business. Yeah. and he was head of the stock exchange. Yeah, he was one. He was on the what is now FINRA, the NASD, National Association of Stock Bro- uh, Security Dealers, and that's why one thing that when they audited him, <laughs> they would send the greenest auditors into his office, and they would say. They would tell him, oh, you don't need to worry. When you go into Bernie's office, it's pristine. It's just, <laughs> and he'd send them in a room, this big marble, you know, yeah. mid, mid, midtown office he had with these marble walls. And they, these two green kids with screen horns would sit there, and Bernie would throw a couple files at him and walk in and out once in a while. They'd sit there, and then they'd just leave. <laughs> it raises all sorts of questions. So don't go away. We'll come back to discuss. 
about money with the AFC team, Mike, Chris, and Al on AM 1300, The Answer. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Welcome back. Excuse me. Before the break, we were talking a lot about FTX and, and really what went wrong. And so it leads us to this discussion, you know, regulation and where does things, you know, look going forward? Um, you know, and after this FTX meltdown came to light, you know, the market responded, it dropped about 25%, you know, and in this market, that's, that's just an average day, right? <laughs> but the concerning part is really Binance now. Right, so if you have 82% of the market tied up in these two different exchanges, right? What's gonna happen with this other company? Well, there's some rumors right now that Binance is actually in trouble themselves. There's allegations of them laundering money. There's allegations of them helping the Iranians trade over $8 billion to avoid sanctions, right? CZ, the, the CEO, he was upset that Sam went to the regulators to you know, to start the regulation talk because he was doing a lot of shady stuff that, you know, he'll now get in a lot of trouble for. Mm -hmm. So it just, it leads me to ask you guys, you know, what do you think about regulation moving forward? And what do you think the future of that? I know you're both naturally skeptics <laughs> from the, from the get go. So I, I guess I'm not skeptical. at all. I, I think blockchain and this stuff is not going anywhere. How they regulate it. I think it's going to be interesting. Every new technology we've seen since the internet's going to have, it has these issues. We mm -hmm. saw the, the dot com crash back in the day then. And, and so I don't know, I just don't know how they're going to regulate it. Because yeah. I think each time you go through a situation like this, the politicians get involved, people lose money, politicians get involved, and regulation comes down the road. So mm -hmm. does the administration. And we'll see regulation. I think in terms of what's going on, it's a technology which is finding a place. And we'll probably see a U.S. cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. This time backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government so that you have some backing rather than just a blockchain technology and nothing that it's fixed to. What mm -hmm. will that do to the other cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin? Now, will, will that bolster them or will it make them basically obsolete? I guess for Bitcoin, it doesn't matter because it's decentralized, right? It's the people that left. Remember what an exchange is, right? It matches buyers and sellers. The people that got hurt are the ones that left their coins on the exchange. If you're smart and you know what you're doing in this industry, you have your own ledger, your own wallet, basically a USB drive that you can unplug from the internet that has that code for your Bitcoin on it, right? It is decentralized, that's the value of it. So the people that got hurt are the ones that don't know because they left it on the exchange. And so I think the big takeaway for a lot of people is don't go into these speculative currencies, stick to the blue chips, do not leave your money on an exchange. You know, this, is, this is kind of like life imitating art or art imitating life, but I don't know if you watch the show Billions. Uh -huh. I just finished the sixth season and the main character who runs a hedge fund wants to run for president. <laughs> And so he's real philanthropic and wants to do something for the city of New York. So he wants to start, what do they call it? You know, a minimum, he wants to give everybody like a thousand bucks a month, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and so he starts his own money. It's called Mike Money. And he has, it was $3 billion in Bitcoin that he was going to use to start it. So. <laughs> I mean, that's that's that's, that's how Sam started his FTT coin, just out of thin air, just like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's careful. I, I the big question for me is where does this leave Gary Gensler? I mean, you, we've seen the relationship between him, Caroline's dad, Caroline, Sam, right? We've seen that little trifecta. You know, where does this leave him? He's supposed to be, you know, in charge of the the regulation, and it seems like he was he, he was very hands on with with Sam and some of these culprits. Did he have any stake in the company? No, no stake. Not that I know of. But he was essentially going to give FTX a get out of jail free card in when, when they had all met, right? They were just going to look the other way. And so here's a question I have, Mike. What do you think of this. When, and Chris, when long term capital went belly up and they had to go and bail it out, why didn't he go and just get, see if they would bail him out? See if the Federal Reserve and see if the other banks would bail him out? Oh, Greenspan met with all the banks and said, you have to put up no, the money right, to bail him out. Right, right. Because... It was, what's his name that didn't... Greens no, no the, what was the bank that didn't layman? Bear Stern. Bear Stern said no, and they went went away in 2008. But why, I wonder why that didn't happen, why he didn't get a bailout from... From the, the Fed? From the Fed, from other banks saying, hey... Why do you have, think? What do you think? I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if he if he tried to get money to get bailed out and say, hey, it's, a lot of people are going to lose money if we do this because it has going to and it's going to have an effect on the economy and it's going to affect on the the confidence in this new technology. 
and I, I made a couple. I made some risky bets. And I made a couple mistakes. Let's fix this, and I can, you know. No, it was one mistake when the ruble got devalued. Yeah, that one. Yeah. They completely wiped out all the equity and went negative yep. on long-term capital. Yeah, but we. And I think it was a gutsy move on Greenspan's part, because they could have said, "Okay, we will." The Fed will bail them out, just like they did in 2008. Right. But Greenspan went to the banks and said, you will put up the money to cover their loss. Right. I think it was a gutsy move. The no, banks, I agree with you. I agree. The I'm banks sorry. didn't have to do that. In fact, Bear Stearns didn't do that. Yeah. And Greenspan, instead of using and issuing money, as we did in 2008 and 2020, Greenspan said, look, you're all bankers, and some of you have investments. A lot of them had investments in long-term long capital. capital yep. They said, these are your investments. Rather than writing off the investments, you're going to have to put in more money. You think like the, like BlackRock, the largest money manager in the world, what, $10 trillion now? Mm -hmm. Would have, if they had known, would have said, hey, we got could have had some sway in getting, that, getting some sort of bailout and getting, that, getting the ship uh, right in the ship there. I think that's possible, except in the case of the banks, in terms of long-term capital, long-term capital had bonds. Yeah. They were highly leveraged, and the leverage worked against them. And, of course, when everything sinks, I mean, I can remember buying bonds for clients at prices which were just extraordinary. I would love to do that again. I mean, they were selling <laughs> a 25 or 30 percent discount, and within a year, they'd recovered completely. Mm -hmm. But there were securities there, right? With, right, F, right. with an FTT, FTT? yeah, yeah. There's, that's that's. There's no security I know, there. I know. There's, I agree. There's nothing back <clears> there. So BlackRock could have gone in and and made trades in FTT and driven the the price through the roof, and everything would have been fine. But it, yeah. it's all just smoke and mirrors. Mm -hmm. And it goes to show why decentralization, when you're looking at this industry, is important. Because when you have centralization, we can see exactly what happens. I mean, FTT is the perfect example. Yeah. But will there, will there be centralization? Will this crypto, will this force, we talked about, you know, like a Fed coin. Mm -hmm. But regardless of a Fed coin, will it force some sort of, uh, not decentralization, but some sort of, I hate to use the word, but like a cartel, right? <laughs> so they can bail each other out, so they can back each other up with this stuff. I, I don't know. We'll see. We're coming coming to the end of the program. I think the whole point of this is to make you, the listener, aware of what went on and the abuses that can happen. The idea is to stick to something that you is know. solid, <laughs> worthwhile, and where it's transparent and it's not manipulable. That's the whole focus of this whole thing. It's a fun story to talk about. It'll be a fun story like many of the others we talk about as long as you're not burned in the whole thing <laughs> as long as you didn't put your entire 650 million <laughs> 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 and yes he will need a contract bigger than Russell Wilson <laughs> <laughs> have a good weekend we will be back next week actually, and talk about money. You've been listening to About Money with registered investment advisors, Mike Adams, Chris Yand, and Al Souza. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today or about AFC's investment philosophy and strategy, or if you'd like the AFC team to evaluate your own portfolio, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. The information shared in the preceding program was for educational purposes only, and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. Join us again next Saturday at noon for more About Money with Mike Adams here on AM 1300, The Answer. The preceding program was sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts.